in the ocean twilight zone. Um, oh, I have to consent. Okay, we're recording. Uh, classification of broadband acoustic target spectra in the ocean twilight zone. But before I go too much into detail about that, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background both about the ocean twilight zone and why measuring broadband acoustic target spectra can help us learn more about it. Okay, so first, what is the twilight zone? Well, the twilight zone or the mesopelagic zone of the ocean is the region of the ocean that you see here that's just below the epipelagic zone or the sunlight zone and above the bathypelagic zone. So the reason we call it the twilight zone is because it's, there's not a lot of light, it's relatively dark, but there is still a little bit of light that penetrates to mesopelagic depths, um, uh, but quite a bit less than we see in the epipelagic. Uh, and the twilight zone is home to a host of different organisms. And by some estimates, there may be as many as 1 million yet undiscovered species. Um, but here you can just see a few different pictures that have been taken as a part of the Twilight Zone project at Hui of some of the different um, life that you can find there. Uh, so as you can see, there are fish, there are crustaceans, there are gelatinous organisms like jellyfish. Um, and they all have a lot of really different adaptations, a lot of bio bioluminescence to live in this really interesting environment. Um, I mostly put these pictures up because I think they're really cool and wanted to share them. Uh, for the most part, after this, I'm not going to be focusing too much on the biology and focusing a little bit more on acoustic data. But these images should just give you a little bit of a sense of the amount of biodiversity and the really interesting adaptations that some of these organisms have. So from what we already know about the mesopelagic, many of these organisms tend to form what we call deep scattering layers. So these are layers of the ocean that have relatively dense organism density com uh, compared to the surrounding areas. And you can see that in this cartoon here. Another key characteristic of the mesopelagic that's illustrated here is the daily vertical migration. So every evening, many of these organisms migrate up to the surface and then back down in the morning. And one of the reasons that they do this is so that they can feed in the epipelagic waters in the comfort of darkness when visual predators like marine mammals aren't as likely to hunt them. So this is all great, but other than the fact that there are a lot of really cool organisms uh, living in the mesopelagic, why do we need to study it? And why is there a really big push around the globe to study the twilight zone right now? Well, for one, this daily vertical migration creates what we call a biological carbon pump. So by migrating up to the surface and feeding and then back down and, well, pooping, these organisms become a really important part of the carbon cycle in the ocean. And so understanding how this works and how much carbon is sequestered through this process is really important in understanding our changing climate. And as you're likely aware, overfishing and global food supply are major concerns across the globe right now. And so as a result, uh, there's been a lot of discussion around the globe about developing fisheries in the mesopelagic and starting to either fish in those uh, nighttime waters when mesopelagic fish are near the surface or start fishing deeper. And if this is going to happen, it's really, really critical that we understand the role that these organisms play so that we can understand what impact this might have on the food web in the ocean and on the carbon sequestration and the climate. So this leads us to some of the really big questions that are driving research of the twilight zone. First, how much biomass is in the mesopelagic? So how many organisms are there and how big are they? Second, what fraction of these animals migrate? So how many organisms are playing a role in this carbon cycle? And finally, how is this biomass distributed? How many fish are there? How many gelatinous organisms, et cetera? So historically, a common way to study the mesopelagic and, well, fisheries in general, is using active acoustics. Typically, an echo sounder is mounted to the hull of a ship, like you see here, looking down into the water column. And this gives you data that looks something like this. 
So for those of you that haven't worked with echo sounders before, this is called an echogram. And on the, y, on the x axis here, we have time. And on the y axis, we have depth with the surface up here at the top. And the, um, so just by looking at this data, you can see that it actually looks quite a bit like that cartoon that I showed you a few slides ago. You can see that dominant scattering layer here between about 400 and 500 meters depth. You can also see the vertical migration. So in the evening, we see organisms migrating up to the surface and in the morning, see them migrating back down. And the color bar here is what's called volume backscattering strength. So generally speaking, this is going to be higher when we have more organisms or organisms that scatter more sound, so larger fish. More specifically, the volume backscattering strength we denote with SV, and it's a function of the number of organisms that we've measured, the volume of the beam, so the volume of water sampled by the beam. So this is something we know for our specific echo sounder and can measure. And the target strength or the amount of sound scattered by uh, the individual organisms that we're measuring. So just by looking at this equation, you can see how if we're able to make an assumption about what organisms we're seeing and how they scatter sound and make an assumption about what their target strength is, since we know the volume of the beam, from this data, we can come up with an estimate of the number of organisms. And this has been done um, historically in a lot of fisheries applications using this type of instrument. However, in the mesopelagic, it gets a little bit more complicated. And there are a few reasons for this. First, for many fish, the, the part of the fish that contributes the most to that target strength, so scatters the most sound, is the swim bladder. And this is a gas-filled organ that helps fish regulate their buoyancy. However, as we know, as pressure increase, as depth increases, so does pressure. And so the shape of that swim bladder is going to change. And how it scatters sound is going to change as a function of depth. And so this means that for the exact same fish, if we measure its target strength at 200 meters and we measure at 800 meters, we might get entirely different target strength. On top of this, we know that not all fish have swim bladders. But because we don't know all that much about the mesopelagic yet, we don't necessarily know what fraction of fish in the mesopelagic have swim bladders. We also know that some fish might have swim bladders when they're born and then lose them with age, et cetera. So it's really pretty complicated. And finally, of course, we're not just measuring fish. There are those other organisms as well there are gelatinous organisms, crustaceans, et cetera, that are also contributing to this volume backscatter that we measure from the surface. And finally, for any of these organisms, how they scatter sound is going to be a function of frequency. And typically, these, uh, uh, these measurements have been made at just one single frequency. In fisheries applications, a frequency that's used a lot and has been used a lot for preliminary estimates of mesopelagic bile of mass is the frequency that you see here, 38 kilohertz. However, for mesopelagic organisms, uh, for many mesopelagic organisms, this frequency is at a point in this target strength frequency curve where we're relatively sensitive to frequency and things are changing pretty quickly. So this means that it's even more complicated to interpret these measurements. And I'll come back to that in a few slides. So hopefully I've convinced you that this is both a complicated question and an important question of figuring out how we can better understand uh, life in the mesopelagic. So uh, as a part of the Ocean Twilight Zone uh, project at Hui, uh, actually before I arrived, a system was developed called Deep Sea uh, that can, is a cabled system that can travel down into the mesopelagic and it can not only measure the target strengths of individual organisms, but we also combine that information with a whole bunch of other sensors to really start painting a picture of what's going on in this environment. And one of the key features of deep sea is that rather than measuring at just one frequency, which we call narrowband measurements, deep sea uses broadband echo sounders 
that measure over a span of frequencies. So we're actually able to look at that target strength curve as a function of frequency. Uh, and here you can just see a rendering of the deep sea platform. It includes a suite of broadband echo sounders that span a broad frequency range from one to 450 kilohertz, a multi-beam sonar, a holographic camera, optical cameras, a current meter and environmental sensors. So this measures things like the temperature and salinity that allow us to know the sound speed, um, as well as the depth of the platform at any point in time. And finally, an eDNA sampler. So those of you who are familiar with the adaptable monitoring project, package project that I worked on during grad school might be starting to see why I was so excited about working on this project. Similarly, it's an integrated sensor platform where we have a whole bunch of data coming in and need to figure out how to make sense of these really big data volumes. So today I'm just going to focus on one of these instrument subsystems, the broadband echo sounders. And specifically, I'm going to talk about data from just one of the transducers that's a part of this system. It's called the AMR, and it has an effective frequency range from about 25 to 40 kilohertz. You'll remember that I told you 38 kilohertz is the frequency that we're especially interested in it, because it's been used for a lot of measurements in the past. And so that frequency is right in this frequency band. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to learn more um, about what's going on there. So Deep Sea to date has been deployed on two uh, cruises, both of which were off of the New England shelf break, as you can see here. Um, and here you can just see a photo of Deep Sea being deployed just to give you a sense of scale. It's a really big system and deploying it is not an insignificant uh, process. Unfortunately, our cruise uh, this past summer was canceled um, for reasons related to COVID, um, but from those previous two cruises, I think there have been maybe 15 to 20 dives of deep sea so far. But today I'm just really going to zoom in on one of those dives to give you an idea of how we're starting to work with the data from this system. So you can see the shipboard echo sounder data from the dive that I'm going to talk about here. And the white line shows you the depth of deep sea. And I'll note that this data was collected during the daytime. So this is the uh, part of the migration when organisms are back down in the mesopelagic after migration. So we can look at what the data from our AIRMAR in situ echo sounder looks like. Here you can see a short window of data collected around 620 meters depth, around 475 meters depth, in around 330 meters depth. And just like we hoped, you can actually see individual organisms in this data now that we're up close. So we can measure the target strength of individuals, um, which was the original plan. You can also see, uh, especially in this uh, first example that I showed you around 600 meters depth, that as we get farther from the echo sounder, you start to see more and more organisms as the beam gets bigger. So eventually we get to a point where we're no longer able to make out individuals and we're back to measuring that volume backscattering or the combination of many individuals. So in order to get the information we want out of this, we need to be able to pull the individual targets out of this uh, data and look at their target strengths. So to do that, I am implemented automatic target detection. And the first step in doing that is to find the region of the data where we can reliably pull out just individuals who are not measuring volume backscattering. Then uh, detect where we can see organisms that are relatively on axis, so in a straight line from the transducer. And then by using a Fourier transform in a narrow window around the target, we can look at its frequency response. And you can see what that looks like for this target here. So this is great. By running this code, we can get a whole bunch of these target strength curves. But what does that actually tell us? Well, we can turn to scattering models to get a better understanding of what this all means. So here you can see from a model what the scattering from a organism with a gas inclusion like a swim plattered fish would look like. We see this characteristically steep slope at lower frequencies that goes up to a resonance frequency 
at the peak. And then it slowly tapers off and becomes relatively flat at higher frequencies. And I've highlighted here the AIRMAR frequency band. So this model here uses data that um, would be typical for some organisms in the mesopelagic. And you can see here why I was saying that for these organisms, around 38 kilohertz, we might be at a part of the um, target strength curve where we're very sensitive to frequency and might be near that resonance frequency. This target strength curve is not only a function of frequency, as I mentioned before, it's also a function of depth. It's a function of the size of the fish and of the swim bladder. It's a function of the shape of that swim bladder, so the aspect ratio and, and um, how it's shaped, and of the material properties of the fish and the surrounding water. So we can take a look at how we expect this curve to change if we start varying some of those variables. If we hold everything else constant, as we decrease the size of the swim bladder, we expect the resonance frequency to get higher in frequency and lower in target strength. And the opposite is true for as we increase the size of the swim bladder. I'll quickly note here that I mentioned that uh, 38 kilohertz is, had been, is a frequency that was commonly used and is commonly used for measuring epipelagic fish. And because many epipelagic fish are larger, this is generally above the resonance frequency and 38 kilohertz is not in a part of the curve where we're really sensitive to frequency. Um, this starts to become more of a problem in the mesopelagic. We can also look what happens when we change the depth. So again, if we hold everything else constant, as we get deeper, the resonance frequency is generally going to increase at the depths that we're talking about. And as we get shallower, the resonance frequency is going to decrease. Of course, we're not just talking about uh, fish here. Uh, we also are going to have fluid-like organisms. This is going to be a fish without a swim bladder um, or a gelatinous organism like a jellyfish. And their scattering is going to look something like this. And as we get, uh, so you'll notice here that we have a much less steep slope than we saw below the resonance frequency uh, for the gas-bearing organisms. And we're also at lower target strength values generally. And for fluid-like organisms, as we get smaller, the target strength is going to decrease. And as we get bigger, not only is the target strength going to increase, but we're also going to start to see at lower frequencies what we call the geometric scattering regime, where the scattering starts to get a lot more complicated. We see these deep nulls um, and more interesting patterns in the scattering. Okay, so what does this all mean for the data that we measured with the AMR in the mesopelagic? Well, if you think about what we saw in that orange band where I was highlighting the AMR uh, frequency band, you can think that we'll see probably four different types of target spectra. We'll see target spectra that are at resonance. So these are those gas bearing targets where the resonance frequency is in the band that we can measure target spectra that are below resonance, so have a resonance frequency that is at a higher frequency than we can measure. And at the same depth, we would expect these to be smaller uh, fish than those that we see at resonance. We'll also see target spectra that are above resonance. So at the same depth, we would expect these to be larger fish than those are at or below resonance. And finally, we expect to see those fluid-like organisms with lower target strength and less steep of an increasing slope. And when we look at the actual target spectra that we measured, we see just that. We see these four classes of target spectra, um, which is not terribly surprising, but always reassuring. Uh, and of course, we are talking about the real ocean and real measurements. So I'm going to add a fifth class of target spectra here, complex un or unknown, which is those target spectra that our scattering models don't necessarily describe very well, and they don't fit very well into one of these four classes. So by looking at our target spectra and classifying them into these groups, 
we can start to draw some conclusions about what types of organisms we're seeing and what that means for measurements that we're making from the surface. Uh, and we can do some of this annotation by hand. If you're interested in some preliminary results, Chris Bassett just published a paper uh, that included some of this hand annotation and preliminary analysis of data from deep sea. But if we want to start to apply this uh, type of analysis to really long data sets from deep sea and start comparing between dives and between sites, we're going to need a way to do this automatically. And there are a few different options for doing this. The first is to take an unsupervised approach or clustering, where an algorithm is used to uh, divide the data into groups without training data. Uh, so there are a few advantages here. The main one is that we don't require training data. We're just dividing the data into the groups that best, uh, best separate the information that we have. But a drawback is that these clusters aren't necessarily informed by the scattering physics that we're interested in. And we need to choose the correct number of clusters to divide the data into. And that might not necessarily just be the five classes that I have selected. And I did some initial analysis trying to use different clustering algorithms to uh, divide up the data into the way that I wanted. And it really didn't work very well. Another alternative is to use a classification algorithm. So this is where we annotate training data and use that to train an algorithm to predict the classes of the data. And the main advantage here is that the groupings will emulate the classes that we've annotated the data into. But a drawback is that human annotation is obviously very time consuming, especially for those classes of organisms that we might not see as often. We might need to annotate a whole lot of data in order to get a sufficient uh, training data set for those classes. And for the data that we're talking about, it's really difficult to actually be consistent in assigning uh, the classes when doing that human annotation. We're talking about slight changes in slope and slight differences in target strength. And so actually doing that and reliably dividing um, it out for a large training data set can be difficult. So I was interested in uh, exploring if we could, instead of using human annotated data, use those scattering models that I just showed you to generate our training data and use that to train an algorithm to predict the classes of the real target spectra that we measured. And so to do this, I generated 5,000 target spectra using parameters from the literature that were generally representative of mesopelagic organisms. I then first uh, smoothed the data because our real target spectra have more bumps and changes in them than the modeled data and calculated the first derivatives that we had a measure of this um, shape of the spectra because that's what we're really interested in. I then used a very simple machine learning algorithm, the K nearest neighbors algorithm, um, trained using the model target spectra to predict the classes of the uh, spectra that we measured. Of course, this only captures the four classes that we have models for. We still have that fifth complex and unknown class. So I applied a distance threshold to any uh, targets that did not fit well into our model or weren't well described by any of the scattering models and classified those as complex. So in order to validate whether or not this approach actually worked, I first annotated 400 target spectra that were randomly selected across four different dives and across all the different depths that we sampled, and then use this approach to predict which of these classes they fit into. And right off the bat, overall, for 91% of the target spectra that were annotated, the predicted class agreed with the class that I annotated. So that's pretty promising. We can dig a little bit farther into these results using what's called a confusion matrix. So here on the x-axis, you can see the human annotated class, so the class that I assigned, for all the target spectra that are above, below, at resonance, fluid-like, and complex. And then on the y-axis, you can see the class that was predicted by the model. And so all of the correct classifications are across the diagonal here. You can see that in general, we did pretty well. 
We did especially well for these gas fairing targets, so above, below, and at resonance. And we can zoom into a couple of places where the model fails to get a better idea of what those incorrect classifications look like. So here you can see that there were quite a few above and below resonant targets that I annotated that were classified as being at resonance. But if we look at what the spectra in those bins actually look like, you can see that in both cases, they're all target spectra where it looks like there might be a resonance frequency right on the edge of AMR frequency band. So this is an example of a case where doing that human annotation was very difficult to be consistent and have a clear cutoff for where I was saying, this is above resonance and this is at resonance. And so I would argue in this case, the model actually probably did a better job of predicting the class, at least consistently, than I did. And generally, these other misclassifications mirror that same theme. So there were cases where it was somewhat difficult to apply a, um, a class by hand. And while the classification didn't necessarily agree with my annotation, it was likely more consistent using the machine learning approach. OK, so this is great. We now have a way to classify all of the target spectra that we measured. How can we actually now use this information to learn a little bit about the mesopelagic? Because that was our goal in the first place. Well, first we can take a look at how many organisms are in each class as a function of depth. So here you can see the fraction of organisms that are at resonance, below resonance, above resonance, fluid-like, and complex or unknown at each depth that we sampled. And there's a lot going on in this plot, but um, a few things stand out. First, in general, we saw very few of these complex and unknown target spectra. Uh, so in general, the scattering models described our data quite well. We also see relatively few of these fluid-like target spectra. Um, and I'll note that this doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't fluid-like organisms present. It just is uh, telling us that they are generally not measured very well in this frequency band. They are weaker scatterers with lower target strength, so we may just not have been able to detect as many of them. You can also see that here between about 400 and 500 meters deep, which you'll remember is right in the middle of that scattering layer, we see more than half of the scattering is coming from organisms that are below resonance. And finally, you'll see that there's this big peak in above resonance organisms near the surface. And if you remember, I told you that we generally expect the resonance frequency to get lower in frequency with depth. So this makes sense given what we know about the depth dependence of scattering. However, this, cur this plot doesn't just match exactly what we would expect given depth dependence. So it's also telling us that we're seeing changing species compositions throughout the water column. And you'll recall that I mentioned that 38 kilohertz is a frequency that we're particularly interested in. So we can pull out what the average target strength at 38 kilohertz is for each one of these classes. And you can see that on this plot on the right. Um, it's a little bit of a noisy plot, but you can see that the target, the organisms that are at resonance have the highest target strengths just about across the board. Fluid-like organisms have the lowest target strengths, and the above and below resonance are somewhere in the middle. And so this leads us to the question, when volume backscattering measurements are made from the surface, what are we actually measuring? How much of that volume backscatter is made up from these at resonance targets? How much of it is made up from the below resonance targets, et cetera? And we can actually calculate that. So if we go back to that equation for uh, the uh, volume backscatter, in practice, we can calculate what the volume backscatter we expect we would measure from the targets that we measured using the number of organisms that we detected and their average target strength. And we can calculate the uh, 
the volume backscatter that would be contributed from any class. Here I'm showing you that for resonant targets uh, using the same equation. So the volume backscatter just contributed by resonant targets would use the number of resonant targets that we measured and their average target strength. And so with a little bit of blog math, we can estimate the fraction of volume backscatter that would come from targets at resonance or from any class. So what does this look like? Well, on the left here, you can see that same plot that I showed you before, the fraction of organisms. And on the right here, you can see the fraction of volume backscatter at 38 kilohertz contributed by each one of those classes. And right off the bat, we can see that the shapes of these plots look pretty different at most depths. Specifically, right in the middle of the scattering layer where we know there's a lot of organisms, 60% of targets uh, were observed, or 67% of targets were observed below resonance, and 27% of targets were observed at resonance. But the organisms that were observed below resonance only make up about 33% of the volume backscatter, and those that were observed at resonance make up 66% of the volume backscatter. So this is telling us that those organisms that were observed at resonance contribute disproportionately high amounts of the volume backscatter that we measure from the surface. More generally, we can see that the gas-bearing targets, so the above, below, and at resonance targets, account for nearly 100% of the volume backscatter that we're seeing. And in general, this is good news because it's this is an assumption that's been made in a lot of previous studies that have used data like this, that 100% of the volume backscatter comes from gas-bearing organisms. Finally, you'll recall that for gas-bearing targets, the target strength is a function of frequency, depth, size, shape, and the material properties. For all of the target spectra that we measured, we know the frequencies that we measured at, and we know the depth that we saw the organism at. And based on the literature, we can make some pretty good assumptions about the shape and material properties. So for those organisms where we saw the resonance peak and we have a lot of information about the shape of the um, target strength curve, we can come up with an estimate of the size of the organism. So first, we know that the size of targets with resonance peaks in the air mark frequency band is going to change as a function of depth. So here on this plot, I'm showing you the equivalent spherical radius of the swim bladder of the fish in millimeters. And this gray band shows you the size range of organisms that has resonance peaks in the air mark frequency band. So the size that we can resolve at all changes as a function of depth. So here you can see the average size of resonant targets as a function of depth and the standard deviation um, of that same data. So in general, throughout most of the water column, this generally tracks the middle of that gray area, which makes sense. However, right around 500 meters deep, so towards the bottom of this um, dominant scattering layer, we see a dip in the size of organisms that we're seeing that doesn't just track that gray area. So this, in conjunction with the fact that at this depth, we saw a lot more below resonant organisms than we saw at resonance, tells us that we're actually seeing um, smaller organisms at this depth for one reason or another. And while this might and likely is a site-specific result, this is just an example of how we can use this information from deep sea and using this approach to analyze the data to get more information about the species uh, distributions in the mesopelagic. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of big conclusions from this work so far. So first, I've told you how broadband target strength measurements contain information about the type of organism and how it scatters sound. And I've showed you that we can use uh, scattering models as training data to automatically categorize these target spectra based on that information. And the results of this provide insight into the distribution of organisms and how they contribute to volume backscatter measured by a shipboard echo sounder.
So hopefully by doing this, this gives us more information on how we should be making shipboard measurements and interpreting shipboard measurements for those larger scale estimates of, bios, um, of mesopelagic biomass. And also hopefully this same approach might be translatable to other uh, frequencies that we might measure at, other broadband measurements, um, we might be able to apply the same approach. So with that, I'd like to especially acknowledge Andoni Lavery, my postdoc advisor, and Chris Bassett, who is here at UW APL, um, who's been a great mentor in working on all of this, as well as the funding from the Ocean Twilight Zone project, which is funded through the Audacious project, and Deep Sea was funded through an NSF project. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Hey, Emma, I've got a question for you. Hey. Uh, first off, very excellent talk. That was super interesting um, and, and really fascinating to learn more about this Twilight Zone area. Um, my question is, if you can go back to slide, I want to say 37, um, where you're looking at the densities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my question was specifically, would it make sense to use a synthetic aperture sonar or to apply a synthetic aperture sonar um, sort of set up to your data to get you that better resolution for those smaller air bladders? I think 37. Oh. 37. Uh, yeah, so getting the information to start sort of finishing the story, that's one option. And we do have a 500 kilohertz multi beam sonar. Um, I've looked quite a bit at that data and haven't really been able to make a lot of sense of it. I think we're detecting a lot of marine snow, is my best guess. Gotcha. Um, because looking at like density of targets detected and size of targets detected, I haven't been able to really correlate it with what we're seeing in the other instruments. Um, we also have some lower frequency um, as well as higher frequency broadband echo sounders on deep sea. And so pulling those into the analysis is another next step. Gotcha. Very cool. Thank you. So as a as a follow up to that, uh, the other sensors where they they just haven't gotten processed yet for this, uh, would they show similar things? Like it seems like there's a wider frequency band than what what we're showing here in terms of the whole the whole setup, but they're not included in this yet. Yeah. So um, I've done, and Chris has also done some analysis of the next frequency band higher, which is a 70 kilohertz EK80. So it has, I think, around 50 to 90 kilohertz. Um, I haven't included that here. The machine learning with it has been a little bit more complicated because just at the higher frequency, the data are quite a bit more noisy. Um, but in that paper that I mentioned, uh, Chris did some human annotation of the 70 kilohertz data. Um, so that's definitely room for future analysis. And we're still working on some of the engineering challenges with some of the different frequencies and figuring out um, how to process their data. But yeah, definitely a lot more coming. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, I just had one real quick. Hi, Emma, it's good to see you. Yes. Um, I was really curious since one of the motivating problems for this was trying to understand sort of the fisheries aspect of the mesopelagic. Um, that must mean that you're going to have different life stages of all of the, specifically fish, but um, all of the biological. Is there, are you finding that you'll need to account for different life stages in the analysis somehow? So in sort of traditional fisheries applications, the way that you get that target strength measurement that you should be using is using trawls. They'll conduct a trawl and look at both the size distribution and the types of species that you're seeing. And for most 
epipelagic fisheries, there's existing target strength to length curves that you use to understand what the target strength you would expect to see from these organisms is. Um, and so that's exactly how it's done, right? We, we consider the different life stages. Um, that gets a lot more complicated because you can't really just use a linear regression when we have resonance complicating what that looks like. Um, and so figuring out just how we should do that in the mesopelagic is really an open research question and, and what's sort of driving a lot of this research. Um, I don't have a question, just uh, want to say this is really helpful uh, for someone who's seen echo sounder data but just doesn't hasn't seen any of the science done with it so it's really really cool to see this work and um, I feel like I came away from this talk with a better much better understanding of how to use that data and how to apply it and um, I think I will have questions for you about some of the machine learning applications you used here uh, in the months to come but I'll, I'll save those for you now. Uh, if, if no one else has questions I think we'll uh, give another round of digital applause to our speaker. And uh, I'm sure if Emma, if you have questions later, you can uh, reach out to Emma. She's a- uh, Yeah, send me an email. Definitely happy to 